Have you ever wondered why I say in my own totally subjective opinion all the time? And then 12 minutes later wondered, does reality actually exist? And if so, how should we be talking about it? Well, we'll figure all of that out in this week's conceptual idea thought of the week. Here we go. By the way, this is a segment from The Carl King Show. If you enjoy this video, remember to like, subscribe, and send us burritos. We're going to explore the topic of reality, both objective and subjective. In other words, the concrete reality that is external to us versus our own internal personal experiences of that reality. But first, who cares? <laughs> Why does this matter to me? Well, in trying to understand how films work, I want to go deeper than this film was good and this film is bad. That's most of what you find out there in movie reviews. As someone who writes their own films, third-party opinions have no value to me because I'm here to learn. And to do that, I need to focus more accurately on the elements of filmmaking, separating taste from technique and objective measurement rather than subjective commentary. So that's why this week we are contractually obligated to back up and first think about objective and subjective realities. Now, I subscribe to the belief that there is an external objective reality but we can't quite experience it directly or accurately. And here are two metaphors that can help explain that. The first is Plato's allegory of the cave. And the story goes like this. Some people are chained up inside a cave and can't see what's happening outside. They can only see shadows cast on the wall by things outside of the cave. And they have to figure out what is happening based only on the shadows. And that's not easy to do. The second is the metaphor of some blindfolded people trying to describe an elephant. And one blindfolded person might be touching the elephant's trunk, believing that an elephant is long and flexible and soft. And another might be touching the skin on the elephant's side, believing an elephant is rough and solid and heavy. So they aren't aware of the other parts of its body or that there is actually an entire elephant. The meaning of these ideas is that we don't have direct access to reality. It's too big and outside the bounds of our senses. And all of the sensory information is also filtered by our brain. So our brain only alerts us to what aspects of reality it thinks are relevant to our survival from moment to moment. And since we can only see shadows or touch one part of the elephant, we will each experience a different subjective reality. In general, we all experience a close enough approximation of reality. But when we don't, we have problems. In my teenage years, I got sucked into Ayn Rand's philosophy of objectivism, which basically says reality is objective and we should simply act in accordance with it. Well, that sounds easy enough, and it might sound like common sense, and it's actually our default way of operating because we want to believe our eyes. I can see the grass is green, and I can see there's a truck coming towards me. So in that way, Ayn Rand's objectivism is kind of the most obvious philosophy a human could invent. But it has several flaws, and one is the assumption that our perceptions of the world the information our senses detect about objective reality, are accurate, and they are not. Let's talk a little bit about this TED video called Your Brain Hallucinates Your Conscious Reality by Anil Seth. He's professor of cognitive and computational neuroscience at the University of Sussex, and he says the brain is a prediction engine. Perception has to be a process of informed guesswork in which the brain combines these sensory signals with its prior expectations or beliefs about the way the world is to form its best guess 
of what caused those signals. The brain doesn't hear sound or light. What we perceive is its best guess of what's out there in the world. He then demonstrates various perceptual illusions, surprising the audience, and he continues. Instead of perception depending largely on signals coming into the brain from the outside world, it depends as much, if not more, on perceptual predictions flowing in the opposite direction. We don't just passively perceive the world, we actively generate it. The world we experience comes as much, if not more, from the inside out as from the outside in. We're all hallucinating all the time, including right now. It's just that when we agree about our hallucinations, we call that reality. And there's another TED video from Donald Hoffman, cognitive sciences professor at the University of California, Irvine, called Do We See Reality As It Is? And he says, we think of our vision as like a camera. It just takes a picture of objective reality as it is. Now, there is a part of vision that's like a camera. The eye has a lens that focuses an image on the back of the eye where there are 130 million photoreceptors, so the eye is like a 130 megapixel camera. But that doesn't explain the billions of neurons and trillions of synapses that are engaged in vision. What are these neurons up to? Well, neuroscientists tell us that they are creating in real time, all the shapes, objects, colors, and motions that we see. It feels like we're taking a snapshot of this room the way it is, but in fact, we're constructing everything that we see. And the third witness I call to the stand is Steve Vai. And for those of you with Carl King bingo cards, you can mark that one down. And while Steve Vai isn't exactly a scientist, he has a video called And We Are One in which he addresses what he calls the most important question, how do you feel? At 39 minutes, three seconds, he says this, what you perceive in the outside world is a reflection of how you feel, no exceptions. So he's making the argument that our emotional state influences our perceptions. Here's an example. Have you ever read a text message or email that you thought was rude or offensive and then reread it later and discovered the words and meanings changed before your eyes? I've realized that when this happens, it's likely I was already in a bad mood when I read the message, which then affected my interpretation of the message. By the way, there's a funny Key and Peele sketch about texting gone wrong, and I will put a link to that in the show notes. Now, even when we're in a great mood, our minds are plagued by logical fallacies and cognitive biases. And it doesn't matter how objective we try to be or how many Ayn Rand books we read, our brain will still do those things constantly. And it's just like looking at an optical illusion in that we can't not see it even if we know how the illusion works. So even though we know through science that we're all living in our own subjective realities, we still operate and treat each other as if we are sharing a single, unfiltered objective reality. So here are my suggestions for dealing with that. Number one, be careful of the word is. D. David Borland Jr. invented a form of the English language called E prime designed to eliminate the words is and are along with other forms of to be. And here are a few examples. The cat is lost becomes, I can't find the cat. The movie was good becomes, I enjoyed the movie. Steve Vai is the best guitarist becomes, of all the guitarists, I enjoy Steve Vai the most. So we're basically transforming objective statements into subjective statements, and that helps you distinguish fact from opinion. And this E prime structure gives the actor in the sentence clear ownership of the action. Not that anyone cares. And there are arguments against E prime, but I find it to be a helpful tool. Number two, we can use more hedging in our statements. For instance, it seems like, or I suspect, 
or my personal favorite, in my own totally subjective opinion. You can even throw in a maybe, and this can cause the problem of inflating our language, and Grammarly will tell you it sounds less confident, but in the end, it's more intellectually honest. Number three, we should have some reasonable amount of humility and expect to be wrong often. If you don't feel like you were wrong about something today already, I recommend going back and looking at your day more closely. And if you've got other suggestions on navigating objective and subjective realities, go ahead and share them as a comment. That's it for this week's Conceptual Idea Thought of the Week. If you like this video, support the creation of more by joining my Patreon for $1 or $5 a month. That's patreon.com slash carlking. King.